May faith arise in this place. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. Chapter 6. As we come to the concluding verses in the sixth chapter before we move to the next portion, it's been quite a chapter. In fact, those, if you remember, we talk about Mark in terms of uh, the gospel in action and the activity it seems to be intensifying the farther we go into this study. It should not surprise us. We, we believe that Mark's gospel account is Peter's memoirs, that Mark was the amanuensis, the person who took dictation of Peter's reflection. The story he wanted to tell about what Jesus began to do and to teach. He's been rejected in his own hometown at Nazareth. He's put the twelve in a position, going out two by two, to see amazing things, see the power that comes when God is on you and anoints you. Experienced the death of John the Baptist. Tragic, yet triumphant. He's fed multiplied thousands of people on the side of a hill. It's been intense. He walked on the water. What a great example of hope, tangible demonstration of how and why we can hope in Him for all things. And the healing that we've seen early in the Gospel account, and continue, He heals now at, at Gennesaret. I want to read these verses. If you have Mark chapter 6, verses 53 to 56, stand with me if you would, and follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, let me know. We can get you one, but right now you can use the uh, information on our screens, the biblical text put there, so that we're all tracking together. Mark 6, verses 53 to 56. When, when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May we, even as we study it today, know a power coming out from him to us. Touching us at our deepest need, as, as Josh mentioned. Strengthening us for more than we ever thought. Thank you. Be seated, please. We, the, the passage we read responsively, telling of the healing of the demoniac, was a powerful and wonderful miracle of mercy. And even though we read about it and go, wow, what, what, what change, what transforming power. The people who were on the ground, who were ground zero at that event, did not see it that way. They saw it in terms of commercial loss, the loss of a, of a swine herd. Rather than being thrilled that such a powerful one, such a healer was among them, they were terrified of what else he might do. 
How else he might inconvenience them. How else he might invade their comfort. And, and they begged him and said, please depart from us. Leave this place. And he did. It's a, it's a tender scene, though, when the man who had been transformed, the man who knew that whatever else was happening around him, he was not the same man he had been. When he begged to go with Jesus, to follow him. And Jesus taught him, and will teach us from this passage, something about what it means to follow him. To follow him means to obey him, his word, his will, his way. And so Jesus gave him, rather than an invitation to join them in the boat, he gave him an invitation to go, an exhortation to go. And we'll see that in a little bit. You know, this, the narrative in Mark 5 might well have ended there, just with the healing of the man, Except for two things. One is Jesus returned to the area. You see, Gennesaret is a part of what they call the Decapolis, just as is the Gadarenes. They're in close proximity to one another. So when he turns to go to the land of Gennesaret, he is, he is returning to nearby Gadara. So his return to the situation, the return to the area, sets up an opportunity. And the second thing we see is the obedient response of the demoniac to Jesus' command. The only way you explain the people pouring out, not just pouring out, but going and telling other people that, that they, rec they recognize Jesus and Jesus is here. The only way you explain that is that somebody had gone before him. So I want us to see just briefly this morning, first of all, from the, from the text we just read, the, the significance of where Jesus lands. Secondly, the, the explanation of the response of the crowd. And finally, moving back to Mark 5, the power of one testimony. This is a, this is a lakeside, a seaside, Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Gennesaret. As you would imagine, those were, those were population centers. The closer you could get to the sea, the better access you had to a means of, of food. That's why you encounter these fishermen. They were, it, wasn't, it wasn't a casual thing they were doing. They were doing this for a livelihood, to feed their family and to, and to care for their family and to feed others. It was their business. So he lands in this area. Not, ex not exactly. He didn't go right back to where he had gotten off the boat and this man encounters him in the tombs. But he is not far from there uh, when you measure it out. It has significance. All these things he's done in, since, since Mark 5, 1 through 20. All these things he's done. The irony, rejected by the religious people in Nazareth, embraced by a man who was who'd been demon possessed. Terrified by his miracles, walking on the water to the initial terror of his disciples. See, Jesus was a hard figure to ignore. You, you should know that as you read through the Gospels. You either hated him or were very intrigued by him or were in love with him. But, but you don't get the sense when you read the Gospel accounts that people yawned as Jesus came among them or near them. I think there's a sense in which he intends for us to be hard to ignore, not in, a, not in a kooky, quirky way, but in a good way. And it's okay if you, if you stand out as a loving, caring follower of Jesus Christ and people hate you for that, that's okay, because they hated him for that. I think the biggest 
danger the church in the West has today is being ignored. Being ignored. And Jesus would call us up. Call us to rise up. Let faith rise. That our eyes be open not only to the, to the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, but our eyes be open to the things around us. And we'll see what that looks like in a few minutes. So there's a significance to this place. He's, he's returning to an area where he had been. Second thing is, how do you explain the response of the crowd? Listen to this in verses 54 to 56. They, they got out of the boat. The people immediately recognized him. Either from having had personal observation of him I recognized him because there's this band of 13 that folks are talking about that are traveling around this, this rabbi and his 12 followers they recognize him they know who he is he's the miracle working rabbi and they ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. Maybe they recognized him because the, this demoniac had gone to tell the story. He did exactly as Jesus commanded. But look at this in verse 56. How different this is from the last time he was in that area. They begged him to leave. Please depart. And wherever he came... Villages, cities, countryside. So, so there's a lot that's going on here that we don't get the full import of. This, this is not a, a day visit to the area. He is moving into villages, plural, cities, plural, and in the less inhabited countryside, wherever he went. This was the indication. This, was the, this is how you would have known, had you been living that day, you'd have known what was going on. They, they laid, they brought their sick, and they laid their sick in marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. We've heard some amazing stories. Now, we're told as many as touched it were made well. There's... There's the, there's the faith of the woman, remember, with the issue of blood, who said, if I can just, I can just reach out and touch the hem of the garment of someone who's demonstrated such a power with God, surely I'll be benefited from that. And she did that, and immediately she realized in her body that the affliction was gone, and Jesus knew that power had gone out from him. And these folks are, they're not demanding a sit-down with Jesus. They're not demanding that he tell them how it is he does these things. They're hopeful if I can just get close enough. Master, just come close enough for me to touch your robe. Master, we don't want you to spend any time with, with, with our beloved sick. Just come, come near enough that they can touch your robe. We've heard that power comes out of you in ways we'd never heard of before. And we know that there are places in the Gospels that he could, he could do no miracle there because there was no faith. You see just the opposite here. It would be like you and me saying today, if I can just get into the doctor's office, I don't have to see the doctor, he doesn't have to talk personally to me, if I can just get into his office, into one of his examining rooms, I know things will be better. This is where they were. Desperate, but hopeful. The fringe of his garment. And they touched him. All who touched him were told were made well. We're not told that everyone was made well, but all who touched him were made well. Faith to believe. 
But I want us to look at what I think triggered this. Look back at chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Jesus has performed the miracle. The man who was mad, we, we studied this already. I won't go into this at, at length. But the man who was, was mad out of his mind, possessed by a legion of demons, who, as he physically ran toward Jesus, which apparently was his tactic to, to scare people, he is physically running toward Jesus, and the demons recognize who it is, and they shriek. You can almost give a, get a sense of the backpedaling going on. And they beg him, they recognize who he is, and they beg him, do not send us into the wilderness or the abyss. Just do not send us as wandering uh, spirits without a habitation. You realize they're not, they're not all knowing these demonic spirits because they asked to be allowed to inhabit the swine, not, very, not thinking very far ahead. And they drown. So after that miracle, where this has happened and then now the man is clearly clothed, the scripture tells us he's clothed in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's a powerful picture of a disciple. We are keenly aware of our discretion before him. Our mind has been transformed. Paul, Paul talks about it in Romans 12. Stop being conformed to the image of the world. It's stop putting on the world's garments is what he's saying there. Stop dressing and acting like the world, but keep on being transformed. You know the word in Romans 12. It's metamorphosis. Keep on being changed from the inside out by the renewing of the mind. When we are saved, when we are saved, our minds begin to think in line with God. In fact, repentance is, repentance is turning away from the wrong way and turning toward God. It's actually, repentance is metanoia. It's a, literally a change of mind. Clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's the posture of a learner. Teach me, Lord. Jesus would challenge the religious leaders, do you not know this, do you not know that? And they would just, they would recoil, they would just react with a violent attitude of how dare you question us about what we know about, about the law, about the Torah, about the Tanakh, the whole Old Testament. But when he would question those that had disciples' hearts given to them, the man in, born, man in John 9, born blind, do you believe in the Messiah? He says, oh, you show him to me, and I will. Teach me. I, I, don't, I don't know. Teach me. I want to know. And things that I want to, the things that I know that are not so, I want to be taught better. I want to put those aside and have in my mind those things that are true, those things that are noble, that are good, that are pure, that are good report. I, I want to know. It's a change of mind. It's one of the first indications that something has happened. Jesus doesn't save know-it-alls who, after they're saved, continue to be know-it-alls. He saves people, and after that they want to know. The Apostle Paul is our fine example. He is, he's fleshing out his life. He's writing to the church, Philippi, saying, I want to know him. Well, Paul, don't you know him? I want to know him more. I want to know the power. His resurrection. I want to be made somehow conformable to his death. I want to know Jesus. I want my mind, my heart, my life to be saturated with Jesus. I want to know him. And this fellow sitting in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. You read that and you think, wow, what a trophy. Surely Jesus will take him with him. That's his request. 
As he was getting in the boat in verse 18, talking about Jesus, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. He didn't just simply ask, I know the boat may be full. Uh, would it be possible for me to join? No, he's going to be. Rabbi, please. Let me go with you. Begging him. And you might initially think that Jesus disallowing of that is, is not tender, not compassionate. And Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home. Go home to your friends. Folks, how difficult was that for him? We talk about having friends and maybe co-workers and neighbors who are who are sort of difficult people. But you know, as difficult as they might be, real or imagined, they, they have not seen you as someone running around, cutting himself, screaming in the, among the tombs. They, I mean, they don't have that level of, of, of reason to fear you, to, to recoil against you. Can you imagine what it would have been like for this man when he simply took Jesus at his word? Because given the initial response of the herdsman, he had a really challenge, challenging situation on his hands. To go home to his friends. It would have been easier for him to go into foreign lands where they hadn't known him. He didn't have a reputation. didn't have a past. Go home to your friends and tell them this. How much the Lord has done for you. And how he has had mercy on you. Now, I want to say something about sharing the gospel. And the place of the testimony in that. There are people who say, your testimony doesn't mean anything. People need the gospel. Well, that's a false dichotomy. And you see, if Jesus believed that, which, which you found out reading verses like this, he did not. If he believed that, he would say, go home and tell them this, that you have met the one who's been sent by God, who'll be hoisted up to die, and three days later rise from the grave. That's the gospel. He didn't tell this man that. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. How he has had mercy on you. Brothers and sisters, there is a place for your testimony. I would encourage you sometimes sometime sit down and just write it out if you've not thought about it in a while. This is pretty fresh on this man's mind. I think he could... He could go and he had something to say to anyone who would listen to him. You see, my, my mentor, R.F. Gates, used to talk about this. And he said, he said, Bill, there is, when you share with people, you should lead in with, with you, yourself. Then, uh, what I was. When... Uh, when I encountered Jesus, now, everything's changed. Everything's changed. See, the gospel changes everything. And we need to be able to talk about how we have been changed by the gospel. No matter whether you were saved when you were 5, 15, 25, 55, or 95, the gospel changes you. It has changed you. It has changed me. You know my story. I, if religion, if being religious could have gotten it done, then I would have been saved by being religious. But it was the mercy of the Lord to show me that depending on my goodness, 
was empty and meaningless and dangerous because I was simply going to go to hell with all these religious accolades, 100% attendance pins, Bible memory winner pins, etc., etc., etc. I thank God that my mother saw to it that I was, I was put in the way of those things. But the gospel came to me. When the Lord brought me to the end of myself, the gospel came to me. And I was changed, never to be the same. Mercifully, all those things I'd done religiously, that being, being present a lot, to hear a lot of Bible stories, memorizing a lot of Scripture, mercifully, all that came back to me uh, in gospel graces. Mercy. Great mercy. Go home and tell your friends how much the Lord has done for you. Have you, have you thought about that recently? How much has the Lord done for me? Because if we're not careful, what we'll find ourselves doing is talk about how, how terrible life is for me or how, how terrible life is treating me or how I'm, fill in the blank, I'm underappreciated, I'm overworked. I'm, you, if you're not careful, if you don't stop and bring yourself back to that, then we have an enemy of our souls who will see to it that the world that is too much present with us will, will move that blessed reality from our screen. And Jesus' instructions of this man need to be heard by me today and by you today. Go home, go to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. You see, if we feel like we're getting a short end of the stick, a raw deal, then we don't think the Lord has done much for us. And I would submit to you that meditating upon then how you used to be, when, when the Lord Jesus invaded your life through the gospel, that the now takes on a much more powerful meaning, powerful implications. Because very honestly, when I look back at then, I tremble. No, nobody, from the time I was 10 till I was 20, nobody would evangelize me. They had no reason to evangelize me. I was a little Billy Baptist. I was, uh, we got to go find the folks that are lost. Yet, folks, I was as lost as lost can be. In fact, it's, it, it's a dangerous kind of lostness when, you don't, when the people don't look at you and think you're lost. How much the Lord has done for you and how He has had mercy on you. There were two paths set before me by my parents. One was the path of a father who, could, who, who managed to play the religious game had the esteem of people at church who really didn't know him. And yet behind the scenes was, was held captive to so many sinful influences. That was a path I could have traveled. I saw it in my dad. I could travel the path of my mother who was a, a humble, a faithful woman of God, woman of prayer. I heard my mother praying for me at home. I never heard my daddy pray except over the meal and when called upon in the assembly to pray. And for a season, I was headed down that path, that, that religious, do be, get really involved path. And the Lord didn't let me stay there. I think he heard the prayers of my mother who would uh, sometimes in her when she just had enough of me she would say to me do you want to be like your daddy? And that pierced me. 
I did not. And so you think through what you were. You could have been a wonderful little goody two-shoes, never got into trouble. You could have been a bat out of Hades. What you were. Then, when, when Jesus came, when the gospel came to you, I was raised in a church setting, which meant that probably, I, I, they pretty much made us go to cradle roll when, when I was little. They, all the babies had to be over there. And, and there was a certain point at which you were allowed to come into big church. And, but I sat in big church as a child and sat there for years and years, years upon years. Lots of sermons were preached over me, at me. But the day came when it was as if Jesus cleared the room and the preacher was preaching. And it was as if the Lord punched me in the chest and said, I'm talking, he's talking about you. Saved. I go back over that. You, you must go back over that. Paul says that forgetting what's past, yes. But you see, folks, if, if, if the world gets too much with you and it begins to overwhelm you and discourage you, then you must, if you're a child of God, a follower of Christ, you've got to go back to then what you were. You've got to go back to when, when He came in and what He's making you. And how wonderful that is. How, how great things the Lord has done and how He's had mercy on you. And it's in that climate when we, when we get more and more comfortable and more and more regular sharing our testimony with one another. I, I wonder how many, how many of you could give a summary of the testimonies of grace of these people in this family right here. How many could you give it? We believe the Gospel. Be wonderful to know, I think. When. And it's in that setting that when. That now you can speak of the life changing power of faith in Jesus Christ. How he will change everything. He may not change somebody's circumstances immediately, that they're terrible circumstances, but he will change you and me for the circumstances we are in we find ourselves in. He will give us feet to run away from sin. He will give us faith to walk through the valley. And so I submit to you, this man did it. Look at verse 20. And he went away. It's interesting. He desperately wanted to go with Jesus. But he knew he had to obey. Him. That's where the blessing is. He went away. And began to proclaim in the Decapolis, in that region of the ten cities. So that when Jesus would land in the area of Gennesaret, people there had already heard about him. In fact, I submit, heard about him so clearly that they recognized him when he stepped off the boat. He proclaimed in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. My song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous. How wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Do people marvel when you tell them the story? When they say to you in the tough time, how do you make it? How do you get by? How do you, how do you keep up? How do you bear up under? How do you not crater? You say, oh, let me tell you. There was a time when I would have. Then, but when Jesus came, and tell him about that, and say, as my, my brother Arif was all so faithful to say, do you know this Jesus? I'm not asking, do you know about him? Do you know this Jesus? Have you met Jesus? Have you, have you had the experience in your life that a, that a glove, you were, as, you were as dead and empty as a glove with no hand, and Jesus' life came into you like a hand into a glove, and you had life. Do you know him that way? This Jesus who lived a perfect life and died a sinful, sin-bearing death in our place and rose from the grave three days later, do you know, do you know this Jesus? This man's testimony. 
compelled them to want to know him. When he came into the area again, it was a great difference from when he left it. He left it showing the hardness of the human heart that can even resent other people having miracles come to them. He left it showing how hard the heart can be, how dull the heart can be to the work of God. He, he came back and they couldn't wait. They told people, he's back. He's back. The healer is back. The rabbi who healed the man who had demons is, is back. And brothers and sisters, I wonder sometimes what would happen if a congregation or a group of folks within the congregation or just one or two people said, okay, pastor, I, I hear the challenge. I'm taking it. And said, so I'm going to, by God's grace, go to my friends, go back to my home, my friends, my family, my fellow workers, my neighbors, my, and tell them the great things the Lord has done. Just say, have I ever, have I ever told you, you know, we've talked about a lot of things. Have I, have I ever told you the greatest thing that's ever happened to me? Has that ever come up in our conversation? Because if not, I need to tell you that. that everything else you know about me pales. Have I ever told you? about when Jesus came into my life, changed it. When he brought me to obey the gospel, repent of my sins and trust in him, my life's not been the same. The power of one testimony shook the region of the ten cities. Oh, my prayer for you, my prayer for me is that at least the city of Owasso would be shaken. But you know, we live in different places. The city of Claremore, the city of Skytook, the city of Collinsville. Those areas stretching out, stretching south. The places where you work in Tulsa would be shaken. Because we've simply taken Jesus at his word, remembering then what we once were, remembering when, when he came and saved us and changed us, and explains now how life, for some a painful life, for some a challenging life, for some of a very weight, the weight of life, but now I'm happy all the day in Christ because he has made me glad. He gives me joy for the trial and joy for the journey. That was this man's story. So praising his Savior all the day long, he went and told the good news. What he was, how he was changed, what he is now. What a great setting for the gospel to be declared. Let's pray.